to start recording too. There we go. I love all these voices. Nobody else can hear them except us. Okay. So I always, I'm always saying it and everybody's yelling at me when they're, they're like, Julie, we don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Hello, Fred. Hello, Brant. Hello. Hi. How are you both this evening? I'm great. Thanks for having us. I'm great too. Excellent. Thanks for hosting this. Oh. We're so excited to have both of you. It's going to be a great conversation. Let me give, I'm just going to give um, Facebook, we start a couple of minutes late. So people who are joining us, sorry, we're a couple of minutes late. Um, I'm going to give a minute or two for no, for Facebook to notify that we are live. So I'll talk a little bit about Warwick's. Um, you both are San Diegans, am I correct? And well, maybe not native, but you are here in San Diego right this moment. Correct. My mom shopped at Warwick's as a little girl. Okay. We were just talking about that. Because we, my sign there says 1896. So we're celebrating our 125th anniversary this year. So Fred and I were talking in the green room. We're not the oldest bookstore in the country, but we're the oldest continuously family owned. Um, Nancy Warwick's a fourth generation owner. But we're probably one of the older businesses because we were, he was talking about, Fred asked if we were the oldest bookstore in San Diego. And it's like, for sure that. But we might be one of the oldest businesses in San Diego because um, we came here in the 30s. So I'm not sure there's a lot of older businesses that are in San Diego that are older than the 30s. No, my, um, my, my parents would have come or my grandparents would have come here to La Jolla in the, in the 30s, had one of the original houses up on Muralands Hill, was a founding member of the, the Beach and Tennis Club and member of the Darlington House and, right? and shopping at, at Warwick's. Right. So, I mean, it's so we have quite a legacy to uh, to be proud of. And so I love that we're talking about we're we're, we're disruption proof, right? That's, <laughs> hey, that's actually a pretty darn good track record. No doubt about it. If you think about what's happened in the in the publishing and book industry over the last hundred and twenty five years, it's pretty right? incredible. Right? Yep. Well, I think about just what was going on. Two pandemics. Two world wars. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff that was going on too. Just not so. Anyways, right. we're, the, we're a poster child of disruption proof, right? <laughs> That's great. So, anyway, so sorry, I took a little bit more time there than I meant to. But um, Fred and Brant are going to talk for about 30, 35 minutes. I'm going to be talking to people on Facebook chat. Um, I will put disruption proof in there with a link that you can. I'll order it online. I always like to say, anyway, there is to get a book. You can get it from Warwick's um, or any independent bookstore can ship you books, actually. And um, but if you're in La Jolla or the San Diego area, we'd love for you to come by the store and shop. Um, also, in that comment section, please put in any questions that you might have for Brant or Fred, because that is our favorite part too. So don't be shy and put those questions in there, and I'll bring those to them in about a half hour or so. Let me introduce both these gentlemen, and I'll get off the screen. Brett Cooper is CEO and founder of Moves the Needle, a global consultancy specializing in innovation for Fortune 50 companies and entrepreneurs, and the New York Times bestselling author of The Lean Entrepreneur. With over two decades of ex expertise helping companies bring innovative products to market, he blends agile design thinking and lean methodologies to ignite entrepreneurial action within large organizations. Brent is, sought after, is a sought after keynote speaker, startup mentor, and trusted executive advisor. He speaks around the world on organization agility, digital transformation, and how to refocus missions on creating value. We've said it here a couple of times. He's here today to talk to us about disruption proof, empower people, create value, drive change. Joining him today is Fred Greyer. Fred supports Deloitte's. Is that how you say it, Fred? Deloitte. Deloitte, Deloitte. sorry. Yeah. Deloitte Techno Deloitte's Technology, Media, and Telecom Group. Prior to Deloitte, he was a technology reporter at the San Diego Business Journal, where he covered venture capital, startups, and the biotech industry. You two gentlemen have a great conversation. See you in about a half hour. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you so much for the introduction. Warwick's, uh, we appreciate you hosting us today. Grant Cooper, you're the, you're the guest of honor today. Thanks for making the time to speak about your new book. Disruption. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for, thanks for being with me, Fred. Of course. So well, before we get into the questions, I think one thing to note is that this is a local bookstore. You're doing a book tour virtually, and you're going through, you know, these local bookstores. Why did you choose to do that instead of going a different distribution route? Yeah, I mean, we're, so we're, we've got sort of all the traditional, the traditional distribution routes as well. But I do think that, uh, you know, I think that small businesses 
and uh, local and family-owned businesses are the backbone of of our uh, of our economy, but they're also the backbone of our local economies. And uh, I think you know the pandemic during the pandemic for sure was a tough time, and so it's pretty funny to do a virtual tour but actually also make it local, right? Because it doesn't really matter if you're local, anybody in the world could tune on to this call if they wanted to. Um, but the idea really is if people are, are, uh, are interested in buying the book, then I'm hopeful that what they do is buy through their local independent bookstore. Um, and as, as she was just suggesting, all independent bookstores can order and deliver the books just like, just like the big guys, just like Amazon. Um, but so I think that there's uh, there's a lot of community part of bookstores, and I and I love bookstores for that, and and have always been a you know an avid reader, and I used to just absolutely love going and you know drinking coffee and reading a book right there uh, uh, near the bookstore. So it's uh, you know it's definitely part of part of who I am. I think. Yes. Well, I, I love I love that, and to get right into you know your, your new book. You, you had a successful launch, The Lean Entrepreneur. It was a New York Times bestseller. And honestly, you know, you could have just left that one out and you could have, you know, been a success. But you came back and wrote a new book called Disruption Proof. Could you walk me through your thought process of how you got the idea for the, for the book and why now? Uh, during a pandemic or coming out of a pandemic, you decided to read a book, which is interesting. So please um, provide some perspective there. Yeah. So, well, so the lean entrepreneur is a very tactical book, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a deep dive into uh, what I now sort of call in this book, ex exploration mode, right? So what do you do when you're faced with uncertainty and startups uh, face massive uncertainty. And, uh, and so the lean entrepreneur was really, well, how do you not waste your time and money and, and other resources in figuring out what is that nugget that will actually help your business grow and, uh, and so that was a very tactical, deep dive into uh, those methodologies, developing empathy, running experiments, what metrics should you be focused on, that sort of thing. And so really over the last 10 years almost, uh, I've, I've been, my company has taught that to large enterprises. And I guess I followed this trajectory where, uh, you know, when Steve Blank and Eric Reese and others were first doing this, you know, we you have to be facing massive uncertainty. And so it works maybe inside of big companies in the innovation group. And it took me a long time to actually realize that something much bigger was going on. Mm. And what, what's much bigger is this massive change in society going from one that's structured around the, the heart of the industrial age, which I, I think is represented by the assembly line, to this new digital world that is just so interconnected and so complex that it faces uh, it faces uncertainty everywhere. And so if you start thinking about, well, if you have to work differently when you face uncertainty in a startup or in an innovation group, what happens when you face uncertainty everywhere? And, uh, and so that's really what the new book is about. If, we, if we're really facing uncertainty everywhere, then we actually need to integrate that exploration into our daily work. And so that's sort of been anathema to big companies that are like, no, we're execution mode. And, uh, and, the, and in the end, the pandemic really drove that point home because businesses essentially woke up and their core business is gone. Their customers don't have their money anymore. The small businesses are going out of business. The whole core business is completely overturned, which again is massive uncertainty. And so if you were just relying on your innovation group to solve that for you, you are out of luck because you're out of business. And so what, what should you do? Well, in that moment, what you have to do is go into learning mode. You have to go into exploration mode and try to figure out how you're going to stay open. Um, but once we take a step back from that, the idea is how do we actually build into our organizations the resiliency that allows us to actually function in the face of that type of uncertainty? And I think that the complexity of the world that we're in drives that amount of uncertainty. And I think that, you know, this pandemic is certainly not the last event like this. We've had ransomware attack here in, in uh, on a hospital system in, in San Diego. 
Uh, energy grid collapses, you know, in Texas and happened in California not that long ago. Supply chain disruptions, ships get stuck, <laughs> get stuck in a canal and disrupt. So I, I think these things are just going to be ongoing. And it's really because of the interconnected nature of the world and the digitization of the world that makes these things ripple through our economy and our businesses. So we actually have to look at our organizations and manage and organize them differently in order to be resilient in the face of, of endless disruption. I love I love the way you frame that because it sounds like you're you're servicing the startups, people who are you know up and coming or emerging markets, but then you're also servicing these big enterprise clients who have been been, been in the business for you know decades and decades. And so what's interesting too is your background supporting both of these is you know everyone has had to innovate during the COVID nineteen because you know they have to go go to the workforce from work from home and and switch to virtual solutions. Uh, some staffs, some companies have to lay off some staff and, you know, make some difficult decisions and everything came to a grinding halt. And, you know, obviously now in 2021, we've seen, you know, uh, you know, accelerated and incredible uh, progress from the technology standpoint and businesses have been driving record revenue. And I think we're at the end of that kind of like halt, but now we're going into a new era. So how does disruption play into that new era now that we've, we're over you know, the, the, the downturn, but now we're going to a new uh, level of opportunity? This book, how does that work with, how does that guide the future for organizations like startups and enterprise co companies? Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's not even just, just startups and, and enterprise companies. It's, it, it's all of the institutions that we depend on. It's government, it's education, it's nonprofits, it's unions, it's, it, it literally is like, I think that we structure all of this stuff based upon the assembly line. And now if we were to build all of those institutions today from the ground up based upon the way the world is, we would structure them completely differently. And if you look at some of those big tech companies that did really well during the pandemic, uh, you know, you sort of alluded to the fact that, that record revenues, well, a lot of them is because they are structured differently and managed differently already, right? I mean, so most corporations out there dream of being like an Amazon or a Google or a Spotify or, uh, you know, and so uh, a lot of what I, what I talk about in the book are some of the positive aspects of those companies and that the way they function and the way that they organize their teams and the way they measure the progress of those teams. And so, uh, so fundamentally, I think that that's, that's really what the rest of the economy wants to do or needs to do is to look fundamentally at how they're structured and managed so that they can be aware of changes that are going on in the world, changes in the economy, changes in, in factory production in China. Uh, and then the, the key part of that is once you're aware of the change, can you actually change what you're working on based upon that new information? And so, you know, that's often called agile, which is the perfect word. But oftentimes companies will go like, well, no, Agile is a software development methodology, so it doesn't apply to me. Or they use sort of this rigid implementation of what they pretend to be Agile and they've, they've lost all of the principles of that ability to take in new information and change what you're doing. So the example, Fred, that I always give is, you know, you're Nokia and it's 2005 and you create a five-year plan about all of the handsets, the phones that you're going to produce. 2007, Apple launches the iPhone, 2008, iPhone takes over the world, 2009, Nokia is exercise, you know, in the fourth year of executing their 2005 plan. The world has completely changed, but they're unable to adapt to the new reality and probably not even aware of the, of the new reality soon enough. And so that's really, I think for the non-tech, right? So you use the word innovation and the companies that were successful definitely innovated. And I use the scare quotes because it actually has nothing to do with technology. It has to do with the mindset. It has to do with this willingness to change, this willingness to admit that we don't know something. And so that then we have to go into this learning mode and figure it out. And so for all of the non-tech businesses out there, uh, and this includes startups, right? I mean, if, even if you're producing retail or food or uh, you know mobile apps or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, how can they actually build that ethos into their system? And if you're a startup and you kind of have that exploration mode going anyway, how do you maintain that? Because your investors and your advisors are telling you how to structure your company so that it looks like a big business. 
And that's actually how you kill that expiration mode. So that's really the trick. Uh, and, you know, to be honest, it sort of remains to be seen whether the big businesses are going to be able to adopt. But there are some great stories, and I've included some of them in the book, of companies that have been practicing this new exploration behavior of integrating that into the daily work, not the innovation silo, and how they were then able to respond to the pandemic. And it's pretty, pretty extraordinary how successful they were. Incredible. Yeah, I love the way that you said it's not just startups and, and some of these enterprise companies. It's pretty much every sector, education, uh, even the hospitality, there's, there's the biotech industry. There's, there's so many different sectors that's being affected. And, you know, everyone's an innovator and it can be a disruptor if they have that mindset, which you, you talk about in your book there. So, so Fred, there's, a, there's even an example in the book of the city of Hayward, right? So government, government can build this in too. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. They, the city of Hayward is completely surrounded by Silicon Valley, by some of the wealthiest cities in the world. And Hayward itself is actually a relatively poor city. And, uh, and their fire chief came to the city manager one day in March, early March, 2020, and said, you know, a couple of our paramedics have been exposed to COVID, but we have no means of testing them, so they can't come into work. And the city manager was all like, all right, go figure it out. And before the end of March, the city of Hayward had the first free public COVID testing center in the world or in the U.S., up and running and the, and the county of, Hay of Alameda ended up using it. And there's like videos on their website of like miles of cars of people that are lined up so that they could get tested in COVID. This is before the end of March, 2020. And it's because this city of all things, this government had built in this, this ability to be dynamic and to change course based upon new information. And it's just a, it's what, like one of my favorite examples that, all institutions need this. And, and I, it's, you know, to be honest, Fred, it's hard to fathom how much better the world would be if all governments had, would actually implement these type of practices. Um, they actually save money because they can go and they, they learn how to communicate with their constituents in different ways and run experiments and try to figure out what really works and what's the best bang for the buck. You dive into that a little bit more because I actually was listening to one of your podcasts and it was about how sometimes when you're presenting something to stakeholders, uh, you're asking or pitching, you know, your, your boss to, to get approval to try something. And you kind of argue the notion that you should experiment and come together with some with some data. So right. Another point. Can you talk more about that? Yeah. So it's, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's sort of my favorite example. And it really does come from the startup world. Um and the sense is, is that if you, if you go to a group of people, smart people, and you pitch an idea, then what you're doing is you're, you're, you're really asking your audience, using, they're using their critical faculties, right? You're asking them to poke holes in your idea. And I'm sure you've been to Fred pitch contests where this is the case, right? I mean, you've essentially asked that panel, okay, poke holes in my idea. And it's like, there's an infinite number of reasons why an idea might fail. And so the fact that you ask a smart person to, to, to come up with some of them is it's actually not that it's not that helpful. Mm -hmm. So instead, bring evidence for your idea. And 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 by evidence, I don't mean that you've you know Googled uh, the micro the the iPhone you know market share, but rather the ways that you've run experiments um, to test, to validate or invalidate assumptions. And, and talking to, to customers and observing customers and the more knowledge that you bring about actual behavior of customers and that sort of evidence that your idea works, right? What are your engagement numbers? Go build your company and then ask for money. So you're bringing, you're bringing evidence for the idea. Now, you're still asking the leaders to poke holes, but now they're poking holes in evidence. And that's actually fair game. You don't have enough evidence. And so they're actually telling you what you need to go and figure out before you're going to get funding for the idea. And so that's really the idea of pitching evidence instead of just pitching ideas. Ideas, they're dime a dozen. Or maybe, you know, with inflation, they're dime a two dozen. And, and, it's, uh, and so you, you, you have to be able to, you have to be able to pitch evidence that suggests that you've already figured it out partly and then that's what deserves more funding, not just, you know, the quality of your PowerPoint. 
Wow, that's such a great insight that a great nugget. So this is a fun question. You know, you don't have to, if you don't have someone in mind, but I just want to throw this out there. Who are your, some of your favorite uh, disruptors or innovators? This could be leaders, this could be companies. Who really uh, embody that disruptor-proof mindset that, you, that you're seeing today? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure... I'm not sure they would be household names. I mean, I think that the the Kelly McAdoo is the city manager at the city of Hayward. And so to me, you, you know, she's doing this. She's not doing this for fanfare, right? I mean, this is just the way she runs her, her smaller city. And uh, uh, Karsten Newberry is the guy that was at Gerber Technologies. And so that's a, a textile manufacturing hardware and software provider. And so they're the ones that, you know, he's, this guy's been practicing sort of lean innovation techniques, which is this combination of developing empathy and running experiments and being agile. You know, he's been practicing that for probably 10 years in his career. And that has absolutely nothing to do about me. It's really, you know, it's his mindset. And so they're picking up, they're picking up that their, their clients factories are closing in China in late 2019, early 2020. And so there are, you know, this is sort of the, I've got the, that acronym in the book, RAD, right? So a nice San Diego acronym, but it stands for being resilient, aware, and dynamic. And so their awareness is understanding that there's, there's something going on, that there's these things that are changing their client's outcome, their client's performance in late 2019 and early 2020. And so now they're sort of aware of the early stages of, of the pandemic. And before the end of March 2020, they had converted hundreds of their clients into producing PPE instead of their normal clothes. So again, they make digital fabrication, software, hardware for uh, fashion brands. And uh, their factories are starting to close in early 2020 because of the pandemic. And so then that's declining the revenues of Gerber Technologies. And before the end of March of 2020, they had implemented this sort of this platform, this community around converting fashion brands into producing PPE, which not only was benefiting society because we had a shortage of PPE back in those in, in, at that time, but they're also saving the revenues of the companies and thereby saving the revenues and opening up a real in the end, a new line of business for Gerber Technologies. And so again, to me, it's that it's demonstrating that they've already built that rad mindset. And uh, and then the pandemic hits and they demonstrate the effect and effectiveness of that mindset because of how quickly they're able to adapt to the new world. And so, you know, there's tons of other examples just locally, right? The restaurants that were able to convert to curbside or delivery versus those that, that didn't right? One survives, one's out of business. And so I think that the pandemic ends up driving home, you know, a lot of examples of the benefits of that type of behavior. Um, and I think that the same thing, the same thing is true of the companies that weren't able to adapt to supply chain issues or to ransomware attacks. Um, you know, they focus so much on financial efficiency that then when the core part of their business is disrupted, they have no alternatives. They have nothing else in place. And, uh, and that's disastrous, right? That's such, such a great point. And I, I like the point that you mentioned that San, San Diego businesses have pivoted and, and adjusted. And I, I think we see sometimes with an older mindset is that I, well, I recently upgraded my, my, my POS system or I upgraded my Wi-Fi. Now there's this new technology I have to buy and learn and, and, and kind of adapt to. And there's the ones that do adjust and there's ones that don't. And at the end of the day, um, there's a, that, that shows a reflection in, in, you know, within a few years of who's, who's the long-term winner. We look at, you know, the Blockbuster and Netflix fight where they had a chance to buy Netflix for a million dollars and they didn't. And then Netflix became the Blockbuster or Airbnb, which is, you know, democratizing the, the hospitality industry. And so I think it's, it's really interesting that you're saying that you have to have a disruption mindset and, you know, really adopt that to stay ahead, stay ahead of the curve. Well, so I actually think, so it, slightly different, the, I think that this era of invention, like most companies don't have to invent tech. They just have to leverage technology. Mm. And, uh, and so there's a couple of things. I think people focus too much on the technology side. And so 
they treat innovation as being invention, right? Or, you know, digital transformation is about, you know, how do I, how do I make a mobile app for my refrigerator or something? You know, so it's, it's, it's not focused on, so, so there's just not, I don't think that the, I think that the threat of startups overtaking your business is way overblown. Mm. Even the blockbuster example, the uh, Netflix disrupted them th through mail order, not through streaming. Mm. I mean, so what, what's the technology win of mail, you know, mailing discs? And blockbuster and how many streaming companies have launched since then? I mean, there must be fifty. So blockbuster even could even start tomorrow if they want to do and add a streaming service. So to me, it's not about the technology; it's about the mindset. It's about admitting that you don't know something, and it's about going into exploration mode to try to figure it out. And and that that isn't just what is the future bringing. That's how do we actually do it today? How do we do it tomorrow? And the thing is, is that. Uh, Part of it is just, you know, as consumers, we're all carrying around computers in our pockets that are thousands of times more powerful than the room sized computers that began the digital revolution. And what that means is we've got so much information in our hands. We know so much about businesses. We know so much about their products and what works and what doesn't that we change our minds overnight. So think about the, this is the other example I, I use. Think about it, you know, back in the 50s or 60s, whenever the first microwave oven that was produced for, for consumers, nobody cares what color the microwave oven was. Nobody cares what the features were. It was so mind-blowing and so extraordinary. And so, you know, it raised sort of the standard of living of people that actually could put that in their, in their kitchen, that as long as the, the company could produce it at a cost that middle class could afford, you knew people would buy it, right? There was very little market risk. It was all about technology risk and operational efficiency. So that's 50s, 60s. Now you look at today, that same microwave oven comes in 25 different colors. It's got all sorts of features, different sizes. And, uh, and you have no idea whether you're, you're, the customer is actually gonna buy your brand or this particular model versus something else. Now the trouble is we know we can build them, right? There's no technology risk. There's really not even operational efficiency risk. We figured out how to do the manufacturing. We've replaced all of the workers with robots. I mean, the price has gone down. We offshored all that stuff. And so the price is low enough. We already know we can do it operationally efficiency. It's the market risk. And yet the way the company is still structured is this centralized command and control, top-down decision-making. But that's not where the information is. The knowledge exists out on the edge. And so we actually have to decentralize the decision-making so that people can respond to where the knowledge is, where the information is. And that's kind of this leap that we have to make is this centralized decision-making uh, versus pushing it out to the edge where people can, based upon this new information coming in, make decisions that will actually benefit the, the consumers or, or solve the problems that are occurring out on the edge. So it's a fundamental shift in, in how we think about business. And I just totally believe that that's what's coming. So either the big businesses do it or they go out of business and somebody replaces them. But it's not they're not going to be replaced because of some technology invention. They're going to be replaced because of a company's ability to respond to the changes on the edge. Yeah, so I think the underlying theme here is you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And uh, yeah, the COVID happened, but now there's going to be a, a new a new change. And you have to be ready for that and adjust. So we're, we're, we're currently at 30 minutes in. Uh, I think we're going to have five more minutes for questions. And feel free to, to, to send your questions in. We would love to get to those. Uh, Brant, I just want to ask you uh, a question related to the book. Was there a chapter that was maybe difficult to write or you feel that is the most important for people to, 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 to read and, and really digest? Yeah, so that's interesting. So there's a couple of different ways I guess I looked at it. There's a um, there's sort of systemic level changes that that have to be made here. So like fundamentally, the book is about teaching companies how to compete based upon creating value again, right? So I I try to make the case that listen, we chose capitalism because capitalism is, is the best way to solve problems, and so capitalism needs to stop causing the problems. They need to go back to solving the problems. But partly that is not up to the founders. Like I'm not, I'm not preaching that CEOs now need to be 
uh, you know, all they everybody needs to turn into a social impact entrepreneur. I know I run my own business. I know that what the business needs to be focused on is the business and not curing uh, social problems. But I do think that it's my ethical responsibility not to cause problems, number one. And number two is that at a systemic level, it is the government's responsibility to rec recognize constituents, i.e. the voters, and pr not only protect their uh, resources and, um, and the safety of products and all of that. I think that that's fundamental. The government needs to do that. And the number one thing that, that I think government has to do is force companies to compete based upon creating value. And how do you do that? You can't allow all of the corporate consolidation. You can't allow the, these companies to get so big that they don't need to compete based upon value again, because that actually starts creating this vicious cycle of you know, not paying people the appropriate amounts and not, uh, not innovating you know, not trying to raise the standard of living and solve problems. If they don't need to compete, they don't need to do those things, they won't. And so we need the system to actually create the incentives and the motivation for those companies to uh, compete based on value. And we've kind of lost that. Uh, we're seeing a backlash now, but it's interesting because it's bipartisan. It's on the left and the right. Uh, on the left and the right are the people that completely support the bigger companies, but on the left and the right, there are also people that are opposed to all of that corporate consolidation. So it's kind of a really interesting time. Uh, but so that's kind of a difficult chapter because I want people to understand that this is a pro-capitalism book, but it's about capitalism that is solving problems and really getting back to strengthening the middle class and solving problems. Uh, I, I say in the book, I go, uh, you know, kids, kip, kids operate a, a, a lemonade stand not because we're capitalist. They, they, uh, we're capitalist because kids naturally go operate a, a lemonade stand, right? I mean, so there's a, it's built into us as human beings. And so we have to kind of get back to this idea that that's a way to, to solve problems. I think that the other chapter of the book, chapter nine, which is kind of interesting to me, is, is making the case that this stuff is happening in all institutions, like we talked about earlier, you know, government and education, unions, nonprofits, all of these companies have to uh, update their their mindset for the digital age. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's such a great, great way to close out. Uh, I would love to have this time for questions. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any? Do we, we have we any could, out there? We could have kept, we could have kept going. Well, I've got some for sure. I'm sitting okay. back there. It's just like, oh, my God. I mean, in most independent stores, as you probably know, brand and especially independent bookstores do not like to talk about Amazon. But all I kept thinking of while you were talking is Amazon. Yeah. Because it, it, it kind of fits into every category you talked about, good and bad. Totally it's right. The one yep. like chomping up. And I think of it as Pac-Man, like just picking up. So talk about Amazon. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's a great example. As a matter of fact, I did a I did a talk last night, and there was a woman there from Amazon. And I always feel like I have to apologize to people, but I, I think that there, every company out there wants to be like Amazon. And one of uh, Jeff Bezos' fundamental things that he's known for is the two pizza team, right? And so there's this idea that you keep the team small, but you also are empowering them to go and solve problems. And it's not about all of those people on that two pizza team doing what they're told. They're not supposed to do what they're told. They're actually supposed to go out and solve problems. And so there again, it's built into the company, this agility and this ability to move fast and this ability to see what else is going on. They, they naturally go and do technology scouting and startup scouting to see what's coming down the pipe. So I think all of that is, is super positive. Now, in the book, I talk about there's five elements of the mindset. And one of those elements is ethics. And I think that that's one place where Amazon falls short because they're so, they're so purposefully moving fast that they actually don't build ethical behavior into the, the systems and into the behavior of their employees. And so I, I think that that's a problem. And some of the other big tech companies suffer from the same thing. Uh, and, and so I think that there's ways that you know, as long as the government doesn't enforce antitrust and the government doesn't enforce existing laws, that that sort of gives these big companies this feeling that they've got carte blanche, they can go right. off and do whatever it is they want, right? Right, right. Because, because that's the thing that they do is that they, 
but they they chomp up their competition they just like they just either they right either they you come into the fold of amazon or they chew you up and then you're gone because you right i mean so that that you know i in my book i go back you know i I majored in economics and i go back to i still have my economics textbook and i go back and i talk about here's the original definition of antitrust and there's so much of these things now that we don't enforce even those those laws are still on the book and so there was a change in the 70s and 80s that started driving hey big is better even though somehow that doesn't apply to government big is big is better and uh and so they're more efficient and all these things and we so we allowed all of this corporate consolidation and and it's a problem the other the other thing that i think is kind of funny about all this is what is the downside of breaking up an amazon well, there is no, it actually creates an investment opportunity. If suddenly you have AWS that is functioning as, you know, a cloud infrastructure company that needs to compete on its own and can't give, for example, Whole Foods a break in pricing that does that allows Whole Foods to compete differently than other companies, right? That's part of the problem about right. the vertical integrations and the horizontal integrations. Right. But so if, if all of these different entities of Amazon actually were forced to compete based upon creating value as independent entities, I would still bet you that those are going to be several very successful companies. And those are just investment opportunities. Right. So somehow we get caught up. We get caught up in this idea that a company that got big deserves to be big, as opposed to us understanding that, no, 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 we we change the rules along the line, right? It's just like football. Do we want there to be a lot of scoring? Okay, we're going to change the rules of football, and suddenly, you know, it's the scores are, are through 45, the roof. 35. Right. <laughs> we can change it tomorrow, and right. and they would all go back to you know nine nine six, all based upon the running game, running it up the middle, right? Exactly. So there are rules to these things that create the outcomes, and when you look at 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 our economy today, transparently, I think most people would admit no matter where they fall on the you know left right continuum that things are are kind of out of whack you know the 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 equilibrium the income distribution and you know sort of all of these different things is sort of out of whack and so right. those yeah, are I mean, the results the there are so many billionaires is just right. insane you know right. and then, so and then are... there's that's i mean when you look at the percentage of people that were in that kind of um economic stratosphere in the beginning of the industrial revolution versus now it's you know it's right and so what we do is we end up what we end up doing is is trying to tweak the outcomes and so this is where people feel like it's a zero sum game and you're robbing peter to pay paul right so you know you've got a bunch of people that are middle class arguing that you don't you shouldn't tax the billionaires okay well whatever the problem to me is is the systemic one that creates the billionaires not how much we should tax people right the tax well, people the billionaires can, can afford the good tax lawyers that find all the loopholes that right. are there. No, but, so there's all that <laughs> no i understand but sort of right i understand that and i agree with you but i also think it's the wrong argument to be making like for my book it's more at a systemic level right. that we're actually we change the rules and the outcome of the rules is this disequilibrium and so we can change the rules again and enforce the rules in a way that the outcomes become more equitable. And then it, there's all of the political debates about all of that other stuff doesn't happen. But do you think that companies like Amazon and that are big companies like that are, quote, too big to fail and they have so much money and so much lobbying power that well, the rules right. won't change? I, I don't know. We're right in the middle of that right now, though. Right. So we've got some serious FTC and DOJ stuff going on. Right. Uh, against Facebook and Amazon and Google's right. next, I'm sure. And so right. they're going to fight back. You know, you can see it in the advertisements and all the rest. Right. Um, but there really is no downside, in my opinion, for society. There's no downside for investors either. It's all just other upside. And again, I kind of go back to what that to me, what the ethos was that th- why I'm capitalist is because it's it's the best system to solve problems. But we have to force company. And if you go back to Adam Smith, the core tenet of Adam Smith capitalism is not laissez-faire, government doesn't do anything. It's right. that the more competition, the better the system works. And so if you go and read even the FTC and what their mandate is, they talk about that. They talk about maintaining competition. Right. And this is, I just, it's really interesting to me that if we just got back to creating competition in markets, a lot of these other problems start to fix themselves. Right, right. 
no, it's, I mean, I, my, I probably have a coworker that's going to watch this later and goes, I can't believe you were talking so much about Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Because we call it the A word, like it's an F word. I mean, it's like the bad word in yeah. our in our business. Because yeah. he was, I, there's a great story of him, and I think it was like 19. There was a book um, expo that's back in um, New York in like the 90s, and he was in a little booth at Book Expo by himself, and he envisioned this whole thing. He because there's a bookseller that talked to him that we and right he, that he he had this master plan. Well, but see, I don't, you know, I don't not, believe not, not to baby to the extent that it was now, but within the book. Oh, no. well, was so that's the thing that like, to me, I'm going to tie this back to the question that Fred asked about pitching an idea versus pitching evidence. To tell you the truth, selling books on the internet is not that earth shattering. Right. And if we look at Facebook, right. Mark Zuckerberg's idea, you know, that everybody else also had of how do I get girls in college is actually <laughs> not that mind blowing of an idea, right? So, right? so it really isn't, you know, about invention and innovation and all of these, you know, glorified words. Right. It's, you know, it's a lot of it is timing, a lot of it is hustle. And I give them both credit for that. And, and actually then building into the organization, this ability to be flexible and even acquire the right companies. And I mean, there's a lot of good business sense in there. Oh, for sure. So, and I don't even take that away for them. I, that's why you have something as powerful on the other side though, which is the government that represents us as voters. Businesses don't vote. Um, and, and that they protect us as workers and protect us as consumers. And that results in a more stable equilibrium that produces the outcomes that we find more equitable as a society. And so that's, yeah. that's, that's the balance. But I think your thing is what you said is, and it's the agility and that's where, you know, we've talked about blockbuster blockbuster had no agility at all. They had these giant, you yeah, know, I see I, I order think, stores yeah. and no thing, you know, so, and the same thing with Bezos and the book industry in the nineties was this, you know, big, big box store thing so it's the agility too yeah and the, yep. like you said not not so much the it, this crazy idea but right anyways. this right. was really fun <laughs> <laughs> and warwick's is still disruption proof after 125 years <laughs> yeah no it's awesome gone through all of the big the big box store oh, cycles and yeah, yeah. i mean probably doing great, better now than ever actually so pretty much i mean yeah. it's you know and it, it's a testament to you know great customers, good customer service, you know, there's, there's right. some things that go back to just some very basic things, yep. um, you know, that um, in, in whatever, whatever you're doing. Well, I, I always love the fact that you guys were in the airport because that actually also was a testament to supporting, you know, the local family owned businesses, which was great. Yeah. I'm glad that the, the government, of, you know, which airports are, you know, that they right. branched out and, and, and made that a possibility too. Totally. Fred, it was very nice to meet you. Thank you for coming in and doing the interview. Thank you for hosting. Uh, Brand is amazing, and Warwick's is thank, thank, thank you again for the opportunity. Yeah. yeah so Brand. for you, you people out there, please support your local independent bookstore. Buy from Warwick's. Uh, look up Fred, uh, and uh, he's on you know on LinkedIn, just like I am. Brant Cooper, reach out Brand at BrantCooper.com, and and yeah. So thanks so much. That was a lot of fun. Excellent. This was really fun. Best of luck with the book. All right. Good night, everybody. You.